All right, welcome to the SRF webinar for um, today. Uh, Sydney is going to do the introduction. My name is Mike Gralia. Just want to welcome everybody and point out that this is being recorded. So um, just you know, you're being on a recorded call right now. And after I stop talking, I'm going to mute everybody and unmute Sydney doing the intro and the speaker. And then we will get going. There will be a time for questions. You can also chat questions to me if you want, or chat questions to everyone just so people see what's being asked. And um, thanks for being here and hope this is useful. And thank you very much to the organizers, Sydney and Mukta, and our speaker for graciously giving us her time. So now I'm going to mute everybody. Boom. Awesome. All right, welcome everybody. We're awesomely excited to begin the SRF um, webinar uh, and to continue with this series. So with the series, we wanna make sure that we are getting our families closer to the science that affects their kids um, to make you aware of research that's being done and opportunities to participate and to empower your communications with your clinicians. Uh, today's topic is SYNGAP-1 Epilepsy Research, Insights into Mechanisms and Therapies. Um, so I have the great pleasure to introduce to us Dr. Shilpa Kadam. She is an Associate Professor of Neurology with Joint Appointments at the Kennedy Krieger Institute and Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Her lab is focused on investigating mechanisms underlying epileptogenesis in acquired and genetic developmental disorders like SYNGAP. Uh, it's interested in discovering novel drug targets and delivery systems directed at the central nervous system. And she has broad clinical exposure to epilepsy management um, and also work in uh, the sleep disorders as well that occur with SYNGAP. So I'm excited about that because my kid has really bad epilepsy and sleep problems. Uh, her work with SYNGAP has been focused on the relationship of poor quality sleep and epilepsy. Uh, they were able to identify abnormal underlying brain activity and a high incidence of seizures during sleep in the mouse models by examining overnight EEG um, for her SYNGAP patients as well. Her laboratory discovered that using a low dose of MyCompa may not prevent seizures, but can help correct the high frequency abnormal brain activity um, in the mouse model. This itself may have beneficial effects during the sleep of SYNGAP patients, and she hopes to um, this approach will lead to a clinical human trial. Dr. Karam is also interested in antisense oligonucleotide therapy to help rescue SYNGAP-1 level in the brain. And she is currently seeking funding for several projects in SYNGAP, with one of the more important um, being CRISPR technologies to create mice models to find potential biomarkers. So we want to let you know that this is um, a recorded version, or sorry, we are recording, and then a this recorded version will be available on the SRF website. So you can actually find the whole webinar series by clicking on collaboration and then going to the Knowledge Center. We have another webinar coming up in two weeks' time on July 16th at 2 p.m. Um, EST, and this will be about how changes to SYNGAP ultimately lead to changes in motor and habit learning. So by the end of this presentation, you'll have an opportunity to have your questions answered, and we'd love to hear from you. You can write them in the chat. For those of you who are maybe just joining us again, um, welcome. And our speaker is Dr. Shilpa Karam, and her talk is SYNGAP-1 Epilepsy Research, Insights into Mechanisms and Therapies. Welcome, Dr. Karam. Thank you. Um, you guys can hear, everyone can hear me? Cool. So. Uh, Thank you, Sydney, for that extensive introduction. I just want to make a tiny correction. The last part of the ASO and CRISPR uh, research is actually being done by Rick Huguner's lab at Hopkins. Uh, we are right now totally focused on the epilepsy. At some point, we might, but but that is uh, his focus, his lab's focus. Uh, so, so, um, so like she said, uh, as you can see, uh, hopefully you all see my screen. We are an epilepsy research lab. Uh, my training has been in epilepsy research and uh, uh, it was Dr. Huguenier who, who um, introduced us to SYNGAP-1 research. Um, the mouse that the data we will, I'll be showing today and we will be discussing is the, is the mouse that his lab generated quite a few years ago. Uh, but it has a very, uh, uh, very critical, uh, a mutation in a very critical uh, domain that, that allows us to study almost uh, 
the most critical functions for SynGAP1, which has been very well um, documented by all his, or his early research and continuing research. So um, what we, I'm hoping to um, try and communicate today is uh, how we approach this research, why did we do it the way we did it, and some of the insights that are maybe uh, very novel that might give, um, uh, that, that generate new hypotheses uh, that my lab myself will pursue uh, in the goal of therapies. And, and um, as parents, you guys know that, uh, you know, understanding how this uh, protein is affecting the brain development is very critical. But at the same time, if we can at the, uh, try and figure out what new therapies might help improve, even by a little bit, the incidence of uh, uh, seizures uh, in children with SYNGAP1 mutations uh, is also important. So my slides are not moving forward. Okay. So uh, all of this information is known to you, but I'm going to give you uh, a background just so that you understand what we are focusing on. So uh, just like Sydney said, um, uh, seizures and sleep disorders are predominantly uh, one of the spectrum of SYNGAP1 haploinsufficiency. And uh, myoclonic and absent seizures are the dominant phenotype both described in Ingrid Schaefer's uh, first cohort study and I, I, I see it as the description for all the uh, reports that I get for the EEGs that uh, the parents have uh, sent us copies for so far. Um, and uh, of course, in epilepsy research, there's a long-standing relationship between epilepsy and sleep problems, especially in uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So at Kennedy Krieger, we have huge focus on Red syndrome, um, and, and there are many similarities in the sense of uh, the progression of the epilepsy, uh, the progression of the learning disabilities and some of the sleep disorders that have been reported by, by parents and have been now uh, phenotyped by the clinicians who are looking at uh, cohorts of patients with SYNGAP mutations. Um, sleep disturbance, I don't have to, uh, are reported in 100% of the patients. Um, uh, problems are uh, with, associated with sleep initiation and frequent uh, night awakenings. Early morning seizures has also been reported. Um, and so this will become important as we try and describe uh, some of the results we found from the analysis of overnight EEGs that parents have sent us and uh, what we then found in the mouse model. Because uh, very, for very obvious reasons, once we have this phenotype, there are certain investigations we can only do in the mice, we cannot do in the children. So that's where uh, translational research becomes so important. So just as a quick background, um, I know many of you have taken your child for clinical EEGs and overnight EEGs. So you may have seen uh, some of the uh, trace recordings either given with, to you in the report or you may have actually seen me the EEG recording. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background and hopefully you can see my mouse. Um, so, so basically right now we are focusing on wake versus sleep EEG. And uh, so wakefulness, uh, the circuits that in our brain that promote wakefulness usually have these very low voltage, fast oscillation kind of uh, EEG phenotype, which is right here, wakefulness, you'll see that there is very low amplitude, high frequency discharges on the EEG. And then there are the three stages of sleep in humans, which is stage one, two, and three. And you can easily see that as the non-REM sleep, which is non-rapid eye movement sleep, becomes more dense, you start moving from this low amplitude, high frequency in stage one to this very high amplitude, low frequency type of uh, sleep um, brain waves. So these are very characteristic of non-REMs. And then we have REM, which is rapid eye. And so the brain alternates between non-REM and REM during our sleep cycles in humans. And REM you can see is almost similar to wake. So it's called paradoxical wake. Uh, and paradoxical, paradoxical sleep because uh, the waveform, if you just looked at it and, and, and you don't know whether the child at that point is awake or asleep on video, you might confuse it to being wakefulness. But it, the significant distinction is that a REM will always be between two non-REMs. So when a non-REM ends, a REM starts and then a non-REM again progresses from stage one to three of non-REM. Um, and because these are associated with frequency oscillations, 
on how the brain is firing in certain frequencies. Uh, I put in this slide on the side in blue, with, which is all a one second discharge. And you can see what we call as high frequency oscillation, which is gamma, which will be the focus of most of the cortical function we are trying to evaluate, both in the mouse and in the human EGs. And so as you can see, this is a high frequency, it's around 30 to 100 Hertz. Then there are other oscillations very well defined in the clinic and we try and apply the same rules to, to the mouse EEG. And so as you go lower in frequency, it's the beta, alpha, theta, but more importantly, delta, which is the most predominant, so this is zero to four Hertz, is the most predominant waveform seen in non-REM stage four. So deep sleep is associated with a high density of delta uh, high brain activity associated with doing some task, being cognitively aroused, is associated with high gamma. So for this talk, we are going to focus on gamma versus delta because they, they are the predominant frequencies in awake versus sleep, okay? So then we'll just start straight away with what we found with one of the um, overnight EEGs from, a, this is a three-year-old child with Syngap-1 mutation. And I'm going to focus here on the middle panel where we have done the power analysis for the frequency. Uh, we had the video also, we had the notes from the clinic. And so if you just focus on, so here on the x-axis, this is a 20 hour long EEG, including the night. So let's say it starts late in the morning and goes on to uh, early in the morning the next day, okay? So that's the x-axis. On the y-axis are the different stages that have been scored for this EG. So here's wake, here's non-REM, here's RAM. So this line over here as it continues is when the child is awake. It jumps up to non-REM when the child first falls asleep and goes into the first non-REM cycle. Um, then as we go forward over the entire time, which is quite a few hours, that this child is asleep, you can see that the child's brain is switching between non-REM REM back to non-REM and it keeps doing that between multiple cycles until the child is awake in the morning and that's the wake state again. So basically this entire jump here is the time based on the EEG and the video and the nose the child was asleep. So then overriding that all the the raster plot of the red lines shows when this child uh, had episodes of short duration three hertz seizures. Here is one example from, let's say from this one event of this high amplitude three hertz spike wave discharge on every channel. So this is a global discharge. And from the background EG, which is noisy, which would always be noisy when the child is awake because they, they're not going to stay still. But what you can see in the background is this very uh, low amplitude, high frequency discharge, which is an indication that this child is awake. The cortex is in mostly in gamma frequency, but in the middle of this gamma frequency, this child has a three hertz a high amplitude, short duration, two or three seconds. So that's an example of, a, of that event happening when the child is awake. Then here there's an expansion of a similar event occurring during sleep. Just on the background, you can make out wake versus sleep because you have these high amplitude delta waves in the background but the seizure episode is exactly identical. It's three hertz, high amplitude, short duration. So that is the phenotype, predominant phenotype of seizures on this EEG. And when we identify every episode that happened in the 24 hours, uh, you get these, that there's an episode and as the child is coming closer to the time, even so at this point, the technician in the room, the parent is, does not know when the child is going to fall asleep but the brain knows when the child is, when the brain is moving towards sleep. And then you can see that there's an increase in the frequency of these discharges. And then there's a short burst right when his, this child's brain transitions from wake to non-REM. And that's here. So these are multiple episodes. That's why that line looks thick. Then what happens as we go through and as we score them independently and just superimpose them, right when this child's brain, because now the child is asleep, so there's no outside influence that would trigger a seizure, but inside brainwave state, the, the child's brain is a non-REM, it switches to REM. That's when his, the brain throws a seizure. Then the brain is in REM and is switching to non-REM. Exactly at that transition point, the brain throws a seizure. Again, another transition point, there's a burst of seizures. But, and then again, at this transition point, there's a burst of seizures. And then 
when the brain knows it's going is the cortical state is moving from sleep to awake even before the child actually wakes up the brain senses the transition state and throws the highest bunch of seizures in this eg so the point i'm trying to make is most of these seizures are ramping up when the brain is transitioning either from wake to sleep or from sleep to wake and very interestingly, even between sleep stages, where there would not be any outside influence of light or, or, move, or, or TV flash or some music, when it's transitioning from non-REM to REM and REM to non-REM, this brain throws this three hertz discharge. And here I have this lowest panel is just an expansion of this, what we are, we are going to call a cluster, that now as the brain, it, as the cortex realizes that this brain is going to go into a wake state, it throws a multitude of these short discharges. They look just looks because it's a tighter time scale, but I'm just trying to show you uh, where four seizures within this cluster, they are not even all the seizures happening in that cluster, start happening repeatedly just before the child is awake. So, so these might happen just when the child is going to wake up or it might happen as soon as the child is awake, which is, I think, well, what the previous reports from the clinicians are where there's reporting from the parents that there's early morning seizures, difficulty falling asleep. Now, as the brain is transitioning, if the brain is seizing, there's lots of literature to figure out why then that child would not transition easily and might have difficulties falling asleep. But these are hypotheses at this point, and that is uh, this kind of interesting distribution is what we're trying to figure out if we can understand better. And then when we test novel therapies, uh, we can we can in doing the same analysis figure out how that is changing or not changing. Okay, so um, so obviously the translational version of it we use a mouse model of Syngap one, and this mouse model, like I said, was generated in the in Rick Huguener's lab. Uh, what we are doing and what we are good at is doing these twenty four hour continuous video EEGs uh, with EMG. Um, and so we have a 12 hour light and dark cycle. So mimicking both the, the daytime and the nighttime. Um, the technical portion is how we, uh, this EEG signal, how we convert it uh, with FFT so that we can analyze all the frequencies within it. And then of course, what was the title of our recently published paper? Uh, is this um, FDA approved drug that we tested, uh, Harampunol, which is an AMPA receptor uh, antagonist. And we chose this drug because of all the literature that Rick's lab has already published showing that Syngap-1 at, at the postsynaptic membrane having this huge impact of how many AMPA receptors are inserted. Now, AMPA receptors are, they receive the excitatory signal. So if there are too little or too many, very simplistically, the, it would completely affect how that circuit is functioning. So just not even as a therapy we wanted to test there's this is the only drug available that's that has this specific mechanism and uh, since it was approved for epilepsy very recently we thought this was the best drug uh, given the data from rick's lab to test in this mouse to see if we block tamper receptors what effect it would have on the eeg and especially on the seizures so first, uh, what I'm showing you is a video um, of one such seizure that we recorded in a Syngap-1 mouse. And hopefully I'll be able to play it again. But what this is, is the early, uh, the early EEG was during sleep. The mouse threw a seizure. And then it transitions to, it has some spikes, but it transitions to a wake EEG. So I just showed you, um, the clinical EEG and how we scored it and on about how these seizures were happening during transitions between sleep and wake and wake and sleep. And so here's an example of a phenotype. Um, maybe I can play it again. So you can see where the seizure happens and these, these are very equidistant spikes associated with spikes on the EMG, like showing that it's a myoclonic seizure. It's a short duration seizure. And, and the frequency, very surprisingly, was three hertz. So this is a three hertz seizure happening at a juncture where the mouse brain is transitioning from sleep to wake. So now the, uh, 
chicken and egg question is, did this mouse brain throw a seizure and that's why it woke up? Or did the mouse brain throw a seizure because the brain was transitioning and whatever is the mechanism by which the cortex changes is its sleep versus wake state, that makes that brain susceptible to throw seizures. So, so those were the questions uh, that came to our mind when we saw very consistently the Syngap mice throwing seizures at these transition points. And the, we were excited with the phenotype because it's, it's a three hertz seizure, it's a myoclonic seizure, and that is the predominant phenotype uh, in the patients. So here's the same seizure without the movement, so you can focus on the leads. So the first lead is the EEG lead. What I'm trying to show you are the spikes that you saw when the mouse was seizing. On, on the bottom is the EMG, and this is to show you that when the cortex is spiking, throwing a spike, the muscles uh, on the back of this mouse, on the neck and shoulders of this mouse, is throwing a spike with a slight delay. So that would be the transmission of the cortical uh, neurons firing and the muscles in the back contracting. So this, this was a, had a nice uh, correlation. And the time, uh, the time um, scale here shows that this is a three hertz seizure. Uh, on the bottom is just another example of a seizure where there are these random spike discharges, but on, uh, you can see the EMG is completely silent. So what does this mean? That there are seizures that you will identify in your child because there will be a motor component, either the eyelid myoclonia that Ingrid has, uh, uh, Ingrid Sheffer has described in their paper. So there's a motor component. And if, if, if you are near your child and you're observing, you will know that something is wrong and some, that, that there's a seizure episode. What this data on the bottom uh, is trying to show you is that there can be seizure activity in the cortex of the mouse, for sure, and the EMG is silent, meaning there is no motor component. And so these, these could be what we call electrographic only seizures, so they will be silent seizures. So there may be a component where there is seizure activity where there will be no behavioral component. And, uh, and those are silent seizures, which is troublesome because if, if there's a huge number of these, the seizure burden on the cortex makes that cortex malfunction even more because severity of seizures can affect how the cortex or the brain functions. So this is the quantification of the seizures we found in the entire study. Um, and uh, so it's basically because we were doing it in two month old mice, which is the P60, and then the same mice when they were older, P120. And you can see that over time when we recorded the number of seizure events went up and the circle here uh, denotes the myoclonic seizure. So the younger mice had the specific just single phenotype, but as they got older, they started showing multiple different phenotypes. Okay, so this is what we would call progression in the mouse model. And, you, and this pie chart here is showing you that most of the seizures were starting in non-REM. And this is very, very well known in both in epilepsy patients and in development disorders associated with seizures that there's something about the non-REM state with the slow oscillation delta wave that makes the brain most susceptible to throw a seizure. So that was the phenotype in the young mouse where most of the seizures were arising from sleep. And then as the mouse got older, you can see that that frequency changed. Most of them were then happening during the wake state. So all this is saying is for the model that, that the phenotype is changing over time. And we know this to be true in developmental disorders that uh, the epilepsy is not static. It sometimes progresses, sometimes it regresses, and then sometimes the type of seizures change. So this is, this is interesting for the mouse model because then now we are having multiple seizure types. And if we do interventions, we can see the effect of multiple interventions on those various phenotypes. So, so this is all good for the modeling world. Dr. Kata, um, may, may I just inter interject quickly? Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt you because I'm no utterly problem. fascinated, but if we could just go back to slide eight for a second. For those of us who aren't, who don't spend a lot of time thinking about mouse models, would you mind just elaborating on what P60 and P120 mean and how those, how those ages translate to, to kid ages? Because this is clearly- no, That's a very important question. And I was definitely going to touch on that because Brennan is on this, on this uh, Zoom call and he's working on, uh, and we are working on doing much younger ages. Uh, because of course, uh, this is a developmental disorder. So this was a pilot study. Uh, P60 means 60 days old. So that's a two month old mouse. So that's a young mouse. Uh, so, so mice are weaned from their 
moms or dams at around P21, right? So that would be the time when, when they can fend for themselves. So P60 is a young mouse, it's definitely not a child though. And P120 is, is just an older mouse and, and here are the significances because then we're trying to record from the same mouse to look at progression. So as a pilot study uh, and coming from the epilepsy research field, there is a very important caveat where even if you look at other papers where people have studied Rett syndrome, CDKL5, uh, you will see that they're using adult mice. And uh, more and more, uh, as we have put these grants for review uh, and reviewing grants, uh, NIH and the reviewers are like, these disorders are developmental, so you need to start looking at much younger ages. Uh, Luckily, that is the bread and butter of our lab. We, we just, we study neonatal seizures in, uh, in pups. Uh, but because this was our, our first initial foray into Syngap-1 and, and nobody had quantified how the epilepsy, what was the, all the phenotypes possible in this model and how it was progressing over age, we needed this, um, we needed this infrastructure to start then going neonatally. Because neonatal EG is tricky, and I will talk about that as because those are the experiments we are doing right now. Thanks. So uh, hopefully that has addressed the question, but I will touch on this again when we start talking about what we are doing currently, uh, so that the ages we are doing right now will be covering the age of even from a newborn to the first two years of life, uh, where we will want to figure out what is happening in the same mouse at early ages. And can we do interventions that would then change the trajectory? But now we know what the trajectory is. So if we did some intervention at in the pups and then we did a P60 again, and lo and behold, they had no seizures, then we, we could convince the NIH uh, or pharma that look, our intervention is changing the progression of this disease, at least for the epilepsy. And then when we talk about the gamma oscillations, which totally underlie cognition, uh, that we are actually trying, we are improving cognition in the mass. So, so this data is critically important because in, in translational research, we need this endpoint to, to uh, have and sh to show data that would have NIH's confidence or, or a small big pharma's confidence that we are actually by some intervention novel or like parampanil that's already approved we are able to change the trajectory of the diseases because developmental disorders have that. It's in an immature brain, uh, an immature brain having seizures, there's lots of literature to show the seizures themselves affect how that brain matures. And so, so it's difficult to parse out uh, how much are the seizures by themselves contributing to the uh, cognitive dysfunction uh, versus the underlying genetic cause uh, that may be contributing to, um, to cognitive dysfunction. So, uh, so part and parcel of seizures are interictal spikes. Interictal means between two seizures. So any kind of spike activity that is now identified by these red asterisks here is called interictal because we know that now we know that this mouse seizes. And so um, uh, interictal spikes by themselves are a huge area of uh, focus and research for being able to predict when a seizure is going to happen. So usually normal EGs will not have these spikes, or at least not in the, at this frequency. So what this very simplistically uh, indicates is that this brain is hyperexcitable. There are times when the person or the mouse is just normally functioning that a bunch of neurons just throw a massive spike together. So this does not happen in a normal brain. This is just an example of spikes happening during wake and spikes happening during non-REM, which is the sleep stage we just discussed. Here again is the background EEG showing you wake, it's small amplitude, higher frequency. Here's the background showing you high amplitudes, lower frequency. The spikes almost look identical. But what this example shows you that in general, we found there were more spikes during non-REM than during wake states. This again ties and is very common in epileptic brains where uh, seizures and spikes happen during sleep states. And that, that circuit uh, state is more conducive uh, for seizures to uh, appear. So here, Brennan went and quantified every spike in the 24-hour EEG, so this is a lot of work. Um, and it shows, so the wild type is the mouse 
uh, that has does not have the mutation. And then the P60 and P20, uh, like we discussed, is the mutant mouse uh, at two months old and then the same mouse older. And you can see a natural progression in the incidence of these spikes. But you can see as the color code is wake versus sleep that most of these spikes and significantly are occurring during sleep. Then we also know uh, that that you know the light phase has an effect on on spike and sleep generation. So because mice have diurnal uh, cycle in addition to the circadian cycle, um, when they sleep during when the lights are on, versus when the lights are off. Why is this important? Because unlike us, rodents are nocturnal. So basically, they're sleeping during the light and they are exploring, eating, grooming during the dark. Uh, and as you can see. Most of these spikes, when we sparse the same data into whether it was during the light sleep cycle or the dark sleep cycle, most of them are occurring during light sleep. So this is when they, when the rodents are sleeping. So this would mean like a child during the night uh, if we make, if you're trying to make a human comparison. And then as we have already seen before, uh, when you look at the sleep stage within light sleep or dark sleep, uh, spikes are driven by non-REM without a doubt. Um, but this is not very unique because this is a red syndrome. Kids will show the same thing. Um, most development disorders that have epilepsy, this matches the profile that non-REM states are make the brain more vulnerable for throwing spikes and seizures. And over here, so this bar on the top is showing you the start of the EG and uh, end of the EG, but the light cycle on. So here the lights are off, lights are on, lights are off. Uh, so this, the black portion adds up to 12 hours, the white portion adds up to 12 hours. And so here's the zero to 24 hour indicating the duration of the EEG. Uh, this is the frequency plot for the number of spikes and you can see how they go up and down at P60. So this is the younger mouse and then the same mice as um, a little bit older. So in general, you can see the frequency of spikes are going up. But when the seizures happen, which are these red lines, this, when the seizures happened in the younger mouse, there does not seem to be a direct correlation between when the spikes were happening and when the seizures, because there seems to be a continuous occurrence of spikes. But when, at, when you look at P120, you can clearly see what we have seen here with the non-REM and in the light cycle. There's a little bump during the light cycle, which is this white bar here. So the frequency of the spikes is going up during their sleep during the light cycle. And the seizures start occurring when this transition is happening. So as the spikes are going up, the seizures are going up. So what all that would mean at this point is that susceptibility for spikes and seizures starts going up at that time point in the light sleep during non-REM. And this is just interesting to keep tabs on because as we start analyzing more of the EEGs coming from the kids with Syngap, we will want to see whether this holds true for the kids too. Uh, and that this has tremendous relevance for when an anti-seizure drug is given to the child. So let's say, uh, just this is just a very simple example. If this is a 24 hour cycle, and, and obviously you're not going to wake up your child and give them medication, well, that's not usually the protocol. But if the seizures are happening at that time and you give your medication here, versus here. It's very easy to hypothesize that this, this dose given here, maybe would be the early morning for the child, will not be efficacious versus if you gave it here, maybe it would stop all of these seizures. So I just want you to keep that in mind on if the seizures are occurring at a particular time of day, but the dose and then the highest concentration of the dose in the body is at a different time of day, uh, that would, for the same dose, have completely different efficacies in the same child. Okay, so this is now so that this is the hypnogram from a mouse. So this is what I mean by the, uh, so here's the, this is 24 hours. Uh, this is the light cycle, here's dark and then the light. So daytime, nighttime, daytime, 12 hours each. Um, and the same thing as we showed before. So the yellow is every, all the time that this mouse is awake. Uh, the blue is when the mouse is in non-REM and the red is when the mouse is in REM. So that's wake, non-REM, REM. So you can clearly see, obviously, there are differences between a mouse hypnogram and a human hypnogram. But the stages are similar. The transitions are similar. 
And when I said ultradian is that you can see that because this is a light cycle, that's when the mouse is sleeping and hiding away from predators. Uh, there are many more uh, sleep cycles. During the dark cycle, when they're very active, exploring, feeding, grooming, uh, they're awake for most of the time, but there are sleep cycles during, those, during the dark phase. And then it moves again to uh, the light phase. So basically, you're now familiar with the three stages, wake, non-rapid eye movement, non-REM, and then REM. Uh, I already said this, the mice are nocturnal, and so they have the ultradian sleep cycle. So hopefully now you understand that uh, what the difference is between a mouse hypnogram and a human hypnogram. So when we looked at these mice and their sleep cycles, because sleep is a huge problem in many developmental disorders, including SENGAP1, uh, here is a wild type hypnogram. Here's the one of the younger, the two month old uh, SENGAP mouse, and then the same mice when they got older. And just eyeballing it, if you see the same mouse at P60 versus P120, you can see the difference in how this mouse is now cycling. Um, and when we quantified that, uh, because mice are nocturnal, and that is critical to their uh, survival. If, if they start uh, being active during the day and, and sleeping most of the time when they're supposed to be exploring and feeding, you can see how that would be detrimental. But when you quantify that, you can see the wild type there's a clear distinction of how much percent of the time they're in wake versus sleep. Um, at P60, this difference goes away a little bit, but it's still significant. At P120, this mouse has completely lost its nocturnal predominance of how it does its activities. And that the same version, this is the same data quantified in a different way. So basically you can see for light and dark, uh, red versus the blue, the wild type and all, uh, as you would expect a normal mouse uh, has a significant difference in how it uh, cycles during the light and dark cycle. And the P60P1, this is lost to a greater extent. So this, of course, we have to see in the light of a mouse, how this would be detrimental for the mouse's survival and, and well-being. Uh, so, this, so the take home message from here is that the sleep cycles are completely disrupted uh, in the Syngap mouse compared to their wild type counterparts. And, and then here we have, this is very, uh, you know, when the mouse is in the cage, the video is on, there is software where you can trace all the movements the, mice does, the mouse does during the 24 hour cycle. So this is quantification of once a, a wild type and a Syngap mouse, here's wild type, here's P120. Um, and the software keeps tracing how the mouse moves. So you can see that during the day, uh, during the 24 hour cycle, the wild type has this amount of movement. You can see a hot spot here, which I would predict would either be where the water spout is or where the food was. Uh, but look at the same, uh, so both this wild type is at 120 and look at the Syngap mouse. This tremendous hyperactivity, the hotspot is in the center here, which would almost mean uh, it's not associated with, uh, with where the food was or where the water spout was. So it's just overall hyperactivity. And when we quantify that based on the light cycle, where here's the, uh, the period when it's dark and this is normal. So the, if you follow the black line, which is a control, which the normal mouse does. And so they are li very little active during the day. And when they're nocturnal, their activity goes up. And this is when they do all their movements uh, all their nesting, grooming stuff. And then it, when the light comes on, it goes down again. And then in the dotted line is the younger Syngap mouse and the solid red, red line is the older Syngap mouse. And you can see there's some hyperactivity even during the cycle, but during the night, this activity is very significantly high. Um, and almost when the lights come on, at the older ages, they don't even stop. They keep going before it comes down. So the, so the take home message here is that these mice replicate some of the phenotypes in, in the Syngap syndrome where there is tremendous hyperactivity. Uh, now, I mean, we will be doing additional tests to see whether this activity is directed or just, just not, uh, not related to any task. Uh, and here's the quantification for the thing showing you the significant increase in hyperactivity in the Syngap mouse. Both at P60, there's a trend and then becomes very hyperactive at 120. So then we move, now we transition. So we now we know this mouse has seizures. We are excited that it has a phenotype of seizures that is actually seen in the patients. We are excited to know that they're happening at the transition points that our early human EEG studies are showing that, that they're occurring at transitions between wake and sleep and non-REM and REM. 
So like I said, there's a huge uh, area research of great researchers who are looking at gamma oscillations in the cortex because it underlies cognitive ability. If you are focused on a task, your gamma oscillations in the cortex go up. Even if you're awake and you're not, you know, you're in a resting stage, your gamma oscillations will go down. So there's a very tight correlation of task engagement, cognition, learning, and gamma oscillations in the cortex. Like I showed you before, uh, it's a 30 to 100 hertz. Uh, in, in mice and because of uh, use, and using protocols from our previous research, we are looking at this 30 to 100 hertz kind of gamma rhythm. And then there's lots of literature to show that gamma oscillations are driven by interneurons. Now interneurons are the neurons that are the no-go no signal in the brain. So there's excitatory neurons, which are the go signal, and the interneurons that are the no-go signal, meaning they stop the neurons from firing. Uh, and one class of these neurons is known as PARV albumin, PV. We will, you will see it as PV in all the uh, next slides, but it stands for PARV albumin interneurons. And there's lots of literature to show that these interneurons, they drive gamma oscillations in the cortex. So here's a simple schematic, and I'll go through this again later on. So, uh, so what I, I just said, that there are excitatory neurons, meaning the ones that fire uh, signals for us to do an activity, if it's motor, or to start, uh, uh, start a rhythm for certain functions in the brain. And those are represented by these blue triangles. So the PYR is pyramidal neurons. These are excitatory. And they are in the cortex in huge numbers. Uh, PARV albumin neurons, it says GABA, because that's the, that's the ligand that causes uh, that's the ligand that's released by these interneurons onto the excitatory neurons that give the no-go no signal. So when this neuron is firing, uh, if a, uh, a parvalumin positive neuron fires onto it, and that's why it's a, uh, a no-go, uh, it will stop this neuron, excitatory neuron from firing. So that's very simple, excitatory, go, inhibitory, no-go. Uh, the red ones are the interneurons, the blue ones are the excitatory neurons. But to make this slightly more complex, these interneurons are connected to each other with electrical synapses, meaning they can then now fire together much faster instead of them communicating to one another, but they also inhibit one another. So there's, this is a very interesting circuit uh, and these, the subgroup of interneurons is very critical in the cortex and we will go over this uh, a little bit later. So for now, right now, uh, what we're looking at is the go signal neurons, the no-go red neurons, they inhibit the excitatory neurons and they talk to each other. They inhibit each other and they also talk to one another. So that is the circuit in the cortex that many people have focused on uh, because they underlie these gamma oscillations in the brain. So these PV interneurons are also called as fast spiking interneurons. And I pulled this slide just so that people who have not seen uh, firing patterns of uh, these no-go signals uh, can understand why this is a special class of interneuron. So here, uh, here's a patch clamp onto an interneuron and, and this B graph is showing you the firing, single firing pattern of fast spiking interneuron, which is RPV interneuron, a non-fast spiking interneuron, which, is, which are the other types of interneurons, and a pyramidal neuron, which was the blue neuron in our pre previous slide. So, so here's the fast spiking. So this if you, if you take anything from this slide is PV interneurons have a very high frequency firing rate. Um, what that means for electrical properties and how this neuron is built has, is all interesting research that's ongoing. And then you can see a non-fast spiking when it goes fast and then it peters out. And your neuron is a much slower firing pattern. So very simplistically, it would be if this blue neuron, which is an interneuron, has to stop this neuron from firing, you would expect that it would have to fire at a much faster rate than the excitatory neuron. So this neuron would fi fire at this rate and stop this neuron from firing. Uh, so, and then the other, if I can go back a slide, the other characteristic of this specific power of albumin interneurons is that they inhibit the neurons right at, on the cell body. It's like before the horse gets out of the stable, it's a no-go signal. So there are, so it's a circuit which controls uh, very tightly the firing pattern of the excitatory neurons. Other interneurons are known to form synapses on the branches 
of the peripheral neuron. So this is a very specific characteristic of a fast spiking image neuron. And then we just talked about the firing pattern. So, uh, so this is just to show you that these interneurons have a very, uh, the ability to, uh, to spike at very fast frequencies compared to the excited neuron and other interneurons. So now this is the same data that we saw for the hypnogram before, and we have color coded it for the gamma power on the EEG for the mice. Okay, so the color code is still the same. We have taken out REM because in the mice, they're very short duration. So basically this with the same color code, this yellow color is the wake, uh, blue is the non-REM, but instead of seeing the hypnogram, now you're seeing every dot here is the 10 second uh, EEG power for gamma frequency, just for the gamma frequency, okay? So here's, so here's again the bar on top for the 24 hours. Uh, this is switched around for the time, uh, the way in which the data is shown. So it starts in the night. Here's the entire 12 hours of light. And then here's the remaining six hours of dark. So what you can see in the wild type, you can see this mouse is going through wake cycles, sleep cycles, wake, sleep, wake cycles, sleep cycles. But what is happening to the gamma power when, when the mouse is waking up and sleeping? As soon as the mouse wakes up, the gamma power goes up. As soon as the mouse sleeps, the gamma power starts falling, okay? So this makes sense for the simplistic thing I said that when you are awake and active and doing something or reading something, the gamma oscillations in your cortex will go up. When you sleep and as the delta slow waves start coming in, gamma power goes down. So this is a way how the brain adjusts. And it's, very, it's known that this is very critical for learning. So why, whenever the gamma power goes up and you're awake and you are learning a new thing, you're reading something new, it is very critical that your gamma power drops during sleep so that the brain can then put that what you've learned or what you've read into your long-term memory so that you remember it the next morning or, or with multiple readings in a few days. So that's how the brain learns. Or this is one of the components uh, that's been proposed underlying uh, learning and memory. So consistently, and this is just an expanded version of the, of the data in this red box. Here, the mouse is awake. As soon as he falls asleep, his gamma starts dropping. Even before the, the mouse is gonna wake up, just as the child is gonna wake up, the gamma starts going up, okay? And you see that consistently. So you see the gamma oscillating up and down, up and down during his life. What happens in the Syngap mouse? So here is an ex example of the, uh, the e same analysis in, uh, from the EEG of a Syngap mouse. And you can see we, the, it's color coded for sleep states, but we don't, the oscillations become very muted. And in fact, if you watch closely here and here, here's the gamma during wake and it's actually jumping up during sleep. So it's the relationship of what gamma should be doing in the cortex is not only gone away, but in certain cycles, it's actually switching. So here you can see, here's the gamma. It goes up during when this mouse falls asleep and actually goes down when it's awake. And then maybe in one cycle, it actually goes up. And so the relationship of the up and down that is so tightly controlled by the cortex is lost. Uh, and that's what's shown here. So, and in this cycle, act we are actually showing the gamma has gone up. So something has completely switched where the relationship of wake and sleep gamma oscillations, the high frequency oscillations, is not only lost, it has reversed in certain cycles. And then we, we, we gave, like I said, PMP stands for parampinol, which is the AMPA receptor antagonist. So this was our first pilot study and, and, and we gave a low dose, which is two milligrams per kilogram. And we just gave two doses. So this is acute dosing, not, not long-term dosing to this mouse. And then the same mouse, this P120 mouse, when they got parampinol, it seemed like it started transitioning again normally. So here you can see this gamma, and instead of going up in the same mouse, it's actually going down. So now gamma oscillations have returned, and that's why we call this as uh, parampinol mediated rescue of the sleep wake gamma transition. And we were very excited to see this because now this is hypothesis driven, right? We are we, are, we hypothesize that since Rick's lab has shown that AMPA receptor insertion is one of the critical uh, functions of SYNGAP1 at the synapse, that when, that, when it's not working uh, and if there are excessive AMPA receptors, uh, what could happen to this transition? And now if you give a drug at a low dose that blocks those AMPA receptors, 
then the cortex now starts oscillating just like in control. So then we went in, we went and quantified this. So this is basically the wild type. Like I said, the dotted line is from wake to non-REM, uh, which would be that the, that, uh, the gamma oscillations are dropping. And the solid line is from non-REM to wake, which is when the gamma should be going up. And so you can see here on, on from the negative scale towards the positive scale, and that's the zero line. As you would expect, all the wake to non-REM, which is the dotted line, are in the negative, which means the gamma, uh, gamma power is falling. These are slopes of the transition. And then from non-REM to wake, when the cortex is getting engaged and gamma is going up in the wild time, you can see all, all of those slopes are in the positive side. And, and those, those two transitions, non-REM to wake, are significantly as expected, different from each other. What happens in syngap? This difference is completely lost. And so that significance goes away. So whether it's one transition or the other, the brain cortex does not seem to be recognizing that it needs to switch uh, to higher or lower gamma. When we gave parampanol acutely, the same mouse, we brought it back to quasi, very significantly back to control. So what we can take away from this data is that AMPA receptors seem to be playing a huge role in these transitions and that a drug that blocks those receptors can acutely switch it back to norm, okay? And this is a very low dose. Two milligrams is a low dose of parampanol. Okay, what is what are we doing for time? Oh my God, I almost took up the whole hour. Um, no, this is amazing. Please keep going. I, okay. I, I so, uh, so then, of course, I, I showed you the first uh, the first syngap child's EEG, and we saw seizures uh, even happening between non-REM and REM. So we wanted to look at those transitions. So we looked at from the yellow to the blue and the blue to the yellow. Now we will look at from the blue to the red and from the red back to the blue, uh, which is this. And these are the heat spectrograms of the EEG. And I just want you to just focus on, this is non-REM to REM transition. This is in a wild type. And if you just eyeball it, you can see that even with a few second transition, the, the heat map of, the, of that EEG is changing, indicating now the brain has transitioned from non-REM to REM. This is from a Syngap mouse. And, it, and that transition now is not that uh, self-evident. It's kind of blurred. And when you quantitate that by power, and I'm gonna make this a little bit shorter by focusing on here, mm -hmm for the gamma, because we have been talking about gamma, uh, the gray and the dark gray are the syngap mice, and, and this transition is, is very weak compared to uh, the wild type mouse. And we give parampanol, the blue, um, it kind of brings it back um, and looks like the control. So these transition states by parampanol are being rescued both from sleep to wake and in, in during sleep from non-REM to REM. And that's what we've done. We've given a low dose parampanol. We have done, not done anything else. And these are adult mice. Um, okay, so that is what I wanted to focus on. We already talked about that. The other thing we did was uh, we did, uh, because I just explained the importance of um, these PV interneurons, and we know their role in uh, gamma oscillations. And when we had this finding, we then we said we have the brains from these mice. And that's why we, you know, we can take the sections, we can stain them, and say we should look at PV interneurons because there's lots of literature to show that PV interneuron or their dysfunction drives gamma oscillation dysfunction. So we stained for PV interneurons, which are in this fluorescent green, that's PV, GLUA2, which is a, a AMPA receptor subunit, and then the blue, which is just a nuclear stain. So every cell will show up. So all the blue dots are all the neurons. The ones with the blue dot and the green are the interneurons. And you can see they are far and few. So the very basic ratio of interneurons to neurons in the cortex is one is to 10. So for every 10 excited neurons, there's one interneuron. And that's all the interneurons. And then there's a subclass of those that are PV positive. So this is just a binary image of that on how we quantitated. And all these little puncta are the synapses that, synapses that these PV interneurons are making on all these other blue cells. So if you just eyeball it, you can see there's a significant difference between the wild type and uh, the Syngap mouse. And so there seems to be a huge reduction in how these interneurons are branching, which we quantified here. And you can see the PV counts, which are the puncta, were significantly lower. Uh, and the number of cells themselves was slightly lower. For the GLUA2, we did not see any significant differences in the sense of how many GLUA2 AMPA receptors were on these PV interneurons, okay? But when we looked in the, uh, uh, in the barrel cortex, so the somatosensory cortex, we saw a completely different picture. 
Uh, again, the, the color coordination is the, exactly the same. The, the green are the PV interneurons, the glue A2 is the red. And because it's such a small signal, here's a, a magnification. And here's the, the arrows are showing you one specific interneuron, PV. And the expansion is showing you that same PV interneuron, how much AMPA receptors it has on its soma, which is the body of the neuron. And this is a wild type, it has some, which we expect. But look at the SYNCAP one. It has significantly higher GLUA2 AMPA receptors on the body of the interneuron. Uh, both in these are these are layers of the cortex, two, three, and five, six, and and this is uh, isocortical meaning similar to human cortex. And so we saw this significant uh, increase in GLUA2. Now we gave propranolol, which is a drug which would block these receptors. And so the connection there is PV interneurons we know have a huge role to play in gamma oscillations. And when we look at the somatosensory cortex of these mice they have this significant increase of AMPA receptor expression on their soma. So this is what I just said. GLUA2 is generally expressed at very low levels in, in GABAergic interneurons. And uh, there is previous work from other uh, researchers, and this, this group is in Germany, where they artificially using genetic techniques did this, right? It was not a syngap mouse. They, they took a mouse and with genetic techniques did this to the mouse. Increased AMPA receptors uh, was, uh, on to GABAergic neurons. What happened when they did this, the GAD UA2 mouse, it significantly disrupted the gamma oscillation. So here's a mouse that they, they just increased the GLUA2 on these GAD positive, which is GABAergic neurons. And it completely disrupted the gamma oscillation. So we are naturally finding this in our syngap mouse, but when somebody else did this using genetic techniques, it resulted in the same disruption. So we were very excited when we came across this paper. Okay, so this is basically what I've been telling you guys about what Rick's lab has contributed, which is a significant contribution for, and this is uh, Yoichi's work, showing very elegantly that when, so this is a normal postsynaptic uh, spine, here are the AMPA receptors in red, these little two things. And there's a very, very well controlled cycle of how many receptors are at the synapse, how they cycle, how they're taken out of circulation, and how they're reinserted. Okay. So now SYNGAP sits in this postsynaptic density. And when it is not functioning, which is this grayed out syn, this cycling is so disrupt gets disrupted and then there's no control, and more and more AMPA receptors start getting inserted. Which is kind of if I showed you when I showed you the thing is this is what we predict is happening. So this mouse has no syngap in the postsynaptic. And for some reason, specifically for these interneurons, more and more AMPA receptors get inserted onto the uh, synapses in this cortex. So this the data that Rick's lab has shown matches what we are seeing, uh, but specifically for interneurons. So coming back to the circuit that you have seen, now, if you put it into perspective, that we know these interneurons inhibit this neuron, right? But we also know that these excitatory neurons synapse onto interneurons. That is how they get the signal. It's a feedback. When there's too much excitation, these, the blue circuit goes and tells, informs the interneurons, okay, you need to do something, and then they come and stop. So there's an input, the brain acts, the interneurons stop the signal. So, so that's how the circuit is controlled, very simplistically. Now, what happens if, as we have seen both with the immunohistochemistry and with Rick's data, what if now this excitation here becomes fourfold? Which means this interneuron will now keep getting signals to keep inhibiting the permanent neuron. Uh, this you can see as simple in learning, you would, you would want uh, some inhibition, but not constant inhibition. This would almost be like a constant no-go signal. And so that, that you can kind of try and understand how that would be for a cortex that's trying to learn something new. But how is this relevant to seizures? People have done this experiment. Here, so what we just talked about is exciting GABAergic neurons, so exciting these PV interneurons. So they use genetic techniques, and you know that people use, the, uh, when you introduce a certain protein into specific cell types, which is here, the, the, these green cells, which are the PV interneurons, and such that when you shine a blue light on them, they all start firing, okay? So this is a genetic technique. And what they're showing here is here's the blue light. Here are our green PV interneurons. When they shine the blue light, all of them start firing. They start firing. What happens when you shut the blue light? 
So all of these interneurons are giving a no-go signal to all these interneurons, one, two, three, four, five. So that is here. So when these all the blue light is on, they're firing all together. And we, we just saw how fast they fire. When they are firing, there's not even a chance that any of these neurons can fire. So they're all silent, these, these five neurons. What happened when they shut off the light? This group of, uh, these, are, these guys are also in Europe. Shut off the blue light. This is called synchronous rebound spiking. Now all the neurons, they fire together. They're not supposed to. When they fire together, what happened on the EG? The mouse threw a seizure. So this is kind of reverse thinking where we think, oh, if the no-go signal is weak, that's how seizures come on. What this group is showing, if the uh, no-go signal is too strong, the brain can also throw a seizure. Now this concept has been around in the epilepsy field for many decades, but now with newer techniques, we are able to prove that this opposite way of throwing seizures is a possibility. Now, why is this important? I just showed you that there's so much excitation onto the PV interneuron, and is that playing a role in these three hertz discharges that the cortices of the children and, and the mouse are throwing seizures for. So uh, hopefully, yeah, this is a summary. Um, so basically what I've shown you is we focused on cortical gamma oscillation. These are these low frequency, uh, low amplitude, high frequency. And the wild type transition, high gamma, low gamma. The syngap mouse, no transition. In fact, sometimes it goes a little higher. You block AMPA receptors, it reverts back right away, back to normal. So this is just the preamplinal drug, it's an amplifier receptor antagonist. So when you give the antagonist, you can rescue that. And these transitions are associated with these three hertz discharges in the mouse. That's the same discharge in the human. So that's the human EEG and, and that's the graphic for that. And then what I showed you was the immunohistochemistry arm showing as the red, because it's the PV in wild type and you can see the red around here, which is here's the negative, you know, the white, black and white version of it of showing how many more amper, blue A2 amper receptors there are on this interneuron from the Syngap brain versus the wild type. So what we, this is denoting is that then this can become a vicious cycle. This hyperexcitation can lead to this gamma oscillation disruption. This disruption in transition can lead to seizures. Now do seizure activity again lead to this further uh, disruption in excitation? That would be an interesting question to parse out. So we, you've seen this before, now you know, you're familiar with what this means for the EEG of this child. And so this is basically to summarize the three hertz short wake, spike wake discharges, seizures in transition states, wake to sleep, sleep to wake, non-REM to REM, early morning seizures, which many parents report, the clinicians have reported, and then that would be a huge transition from gamma, now suddenly has to go up, which then it fails to most likely. Seizure clustering. Seizure clustering is important because if they're not just single events, a bunch of seizures themselves can alter circuits and disrupt learning and memory in any child, even an adult. So this basically summarizes everything I have said, the non-REM component, why we used parampinol, it was a low dose and how you saw just with the single low dose, how it completely altered. And, uh, and that, that has increased the expression of GLUA2 receptors in these PV interneurons. So to summarize, Syngap patients, I said three hertz myoclonic seizures, the mouse has the same phenotype. Then, then children evolve with multiple seizure phenotypes, we saw that too. Seizures at transition states, we saw that. Uh, so low sleep efficiency, we saw complete disruption of the sleep cycle in the mouse. Uh, ADHD is reported in the, in the syndrome and then we, we saw the hyperactivity. What is novel, which usually people don't look at when they, do, when they don't look at the background EG in the clinical EGs that are done in the children, is, is this abnormal gamma homeostasis, meaning the transition between states for gamma oscillation, progressive worsening of the epilepsy, which would be good to get from the natural history registry that you guys are working on. And then uh, this whole focus on GLUA2. Now, why is this important? Parampinol blocks all amper receptors. Uh, GLUA2 is a specific subtype of AMPA receptors, and currently there's no drug on the market that just blocks GLUA2 specifically. So that would be interesting for us to uh, figure out if, you know, to try and either use uh, medicinal chemistry and screen for drugs that would be even more uh, surgically uh, um, like a scalpel rather than a hammer to block only certain uh, types of AMPA receptors, and then maybe we, we could get away with the side effects. 
Uh, our future goals is where uh, you know we are collecting uh, EEGs, overnight EEGs, uh, with children who have been diagnosed with SYNGAP1. And, uh, and then of course, we're looking for different ages because we want to see how this is evolving in children as compared to what we have learned from the mouse. We have now also, we have amended our uh, IRB study to include uh, siblings. If there is a sibling who has, or if you can get an overnight EG for a sibling who does not have SYNGAP1, uh, that would be the best control for, for that background, genetic background family, for us to, uh, to compare sleep cycles with the sibling versus the, the child with the mutation. And of course, we will keep testing novel interventions in the mouse that we have characterized. But like I mentioned before, we are now moved to a much younger age and we're doing EGs in pups. So here is the, this is online and I will, I will send these links. Uh, this is the approved study at Hopkins. And so basically it involves parents signing a consent form that I will send. And if you have any questions, I, I, I'm happy to answer them. And then what it requires for the parent to do is then uh, sign a release form to whichever clinic or hospital the overnight EG was done. And then the hospital directly sends us the actual recording, not the report. We are happy to read the report, but we want the actual EEG recording, the 24 hours or however long it was. If it's an ambulatory EEG done at home, we are happy to take a copy of that too. So that is the study. Uh, we have been recruiting. We have a few EEGs right now, and now we are focusing on analyzing it now that we have this data from the mice and some understanding of what this EEG looks like. And with that, I'll close and acknowledge mainly Brennan, who was the, is the first author on the paper and did the bulk of the work of the data I've shown you today. And then all the people who have been in the lab who have contributed in multiple ways, our funding, and of course, Rick's lab, that we wouldn't be doing SYNGAP research if he had not uh, invited invite us to join the team. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you, Shilpa. If everyone wasn't muted, I think you'd hear a lot of clapping. Um, <laughs> and I apologize for being familiar. I, I'm, I'm so humbled by what I just seen. I feel like I should call you Dr. Kadam more often. Um, but I've just been lucky to have talked to you in the past. So for, please forgive the familiarity. Oh, yeah, no, no. Um, I, I'm not on the doctor bit at all. I know, but you're awesome. So I want to just make three points. And then I want to point you to some of the questions in the, um, in the chat. Okay. Um, the questions have come from Hans and Martha, who were both medical doctors and Singat parents, which isn't surprising, mm -hmm. as well as two questions from Aaron, who has some medical training as well. And so they, they, they were able to keep up with you. I think the rest of us are still digesting. But point one, um, you, saw, you, so you said sibling EEGs. That's actually not as hard as it sounds if you go, go to someone and say, hey, can I get a sleep study, right? Because a sleep study includes an overnight EEG. So if my chubby little two-year-old is having bad sleep, I can get someone to ask for a sleep study and there's a sibling for you. But Right, but I mean, the, the only reason, I, it was other parents, uh, of Syngap children who said that uh, that their neurologist for some reason, and I'm really not clear on this, asked for, or maybe because they were twins, uh, they asked for the sibling, uh, the, the sibling without Syngap one to have an overnight EG. And uh, as a scientist, that would be the great, because we were, you know, exactly what you said, most of our control EGs, because we will have to age match because uh, in children, sleep cycles evolve. A three-year-old sleep cycle is not the same as an eight-year-old. And so we are going to be getting our control EEGs from the sleep center um, at CHOPS, Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Yep. Um, and those kids go for the exact, exact same reason you said, that they have some, the child has some sleep problems, no genetic disorders, uh, and then they get a diagnosis of no problems on the EEG. So we have a collaboration with the investigator there. And, and once we have our cohort, we will get age match EEGs from that center to kind of compare blindly uh, the SYNGAP EEG versus the control EEG. But when I became aware that parents did have sibling EEG, I actually took the trouble to amend the IRB study so that we can also get a copy of the sibling EEG. Will it be very critical? I don't know. Once we have a cohort and we are able to look at it, it will be very interesting uh, to look at the background EEG of the sibling because that would be the best control instead of a child, unrelated child, with maybe some other apnea disorders that might affect that child's EEG, but that's the best control we can get. So um, whether it's easy or not is you guys will give me feedback on, um, because I think it happened organically and I found out it's happening. Uh, I don't know how easy or difficult it will be for you to go and actively seek sibling EEGs for your children. Um, I'll let you know. But the, the second point, and I think the takeaway that anyone who was 
who enjoys this presentation will, will walk away from this is they're going to do what I did after I read your paper and walk into my neurologist's office and say, hey, can we try parampanol? And my neurologist says, well, there's a lot of side effects and blah, blah, blah. And then I say, yes, but what this paper suggests, and please tell me if my interpretation here is wrong. What this paper suggests is that actually parampanol at the dose that's currently recommended for as an AED, yes, we know has side effects, but this, this paper suggested at very low levels where maybe we could avoid the side effects, parampanol could have an impact. That's my first question to you. My second one is I just wanna draw a thick line under something you said earlier, where you pointed out that the same drug at the same quantity at a different time of day, yes. due to the seasonality or whatever the right term is of our kids' seizures can have yes. radically different impacts. And I, I've seen that just in one of the sleep fluids. We give our kid bonfacine for sleep and moving that from well, we gave it to him for behavior, but it turns out to help sleep. When we move that from morning to evening, everything changed. So I just want to emphasize that point you made because I've lived it. But the question really is about the parampanol. Is it, is it true when we're talking to our neurologists about this, that we are talking about radically lower dosing than is currently indicated at, for parampanol as an AED? Is that right? A hundred percent. So the current uh, protocol for introducing parampanol to any child or any adult is they start with the low doses and then they ramp them up over a few weeks. And then it goes to, the, the, they, may not, not, they may not even start at two. If they start at four, the goal is to reach up to 12 milligrams per kilogram. So that is a substantially higher grade uh, of, of, of parampanol dosing. But the major point is if you talk to any, any parents I've talked to, and very few Sindhya children have actually got parampanol that I'm aware of. But other uh, syndromes where parampanol has been tried, this is the common complaint that there are multiple side effects, but there's a distinction. There are no side effects when the low dose is on. The side effects come on when they ramp up the dose and then usually people will just stop it, right? And that's understandable if you're doing it in an outpatient and you, you tell your clinician, no, no, now there's, there's a, the child is sleeping a lot or whatever the problem is with the, with the parampanol dosing. So that's a consistent story. What our data is saying, because our, it is so specific let's say you know these interneurons are showing this high amper receptor right so what is the logic behind that why is the low dose working or what why we think it's working that only with the low dose uh, the side effects come when the high dose block uh, most activity right that's where the sleepiness comes in and all the side effects come in if why is the low dose working here there are a few cells as i just showed you that have this very high level of amper receptors so if you gave a low dose to that same brain, what would that, the maximum effect of the low dose would be on the cells that have the highest amper receptors, not on all the other cells. And so the understanding would be that you could get away with a low dose, which has no side effects, but have the most highest therapeutic effect on the cells that have an abnormally high level of amper receptors. And remember, Syngap is the only one that I'm aware of as a developmental disorder where the specific pathology of high amber receptor insertion is understood, thanks to Rick's lab. Most of the other epilepsy, there's in general high, excit high excitability, which they're giving parampanol to block the entire brain from seizing. So here, parampanol would almost act like a scalpel instead of a hammer. It, it could be, for us, it would be even better if we found a drug that was only gluate 2 specific, which does not exist, but might in the future. And the idea is absolutely right that, that this paradigm does not exist for neurologists right now. They only understand the start with the low dose and ramp up. For a, me as a scientist, it's very clear that the side effects are coming when the ramping up happens, not when the drug is just given in the low dose. So that's one thing to consider. And two, if the seizures are coming because of the disruption of gamma oscillation, then maybe, and we will test this out, maybe just a low dose parampanol is enough for the Syngap child. It may not be true for any other syndrome. It's mm -hmm. very specific to the Syngap 1 mutation. The second important point you said was, when is this drug being given? So right now Syngap is given, you know, usually twice a day. So you usually with the eight hour difference sometime in the morning, sometime before bed. What if we, as we look at more EEGs and we figure out that these transition points are when the child is most vulnerable. And most, now if you look at all the transition points I talked about is wake to sleep, sleep to wake, REM to non-REM. All these are now tied to the sleep cycle. 
So if the, the only dose, if it's given only once a day, is given right before sleep, and then your biggest side effect is sleepiness, then you counter both. It's a win-win. And then you don't give it in the morning. And this is all hypoth hypothetical right now. Okay, so I'm just talking about the fact that what we are seeing and how the drug would be best uh, given. Uh, this has to be parsed out in the clinic. So those are the two things. Yes, the time point when you're giving the drug, what are its known side effects? When are, are you expecting the most seizures to happen in the child? Uh, and then why would you give it in the time when it's not needed? So those, those are the points of things that I'm hoping as we start talking about this data with neurologists is, and changing paradigms and protocols in clinic is very difficult. People do not. And I'm not even aware how this ramping, uh, ramping up dosing protocol came into place. Like who tested it out? How was it tested out? And you may know that Takeda now is actually testing out the use of parampanol in children less than two years of age uh, for safety, as a safety trial. So it's moving in the right direction. These two points are very critical. Why would you ramp up if, based on the pathology, a low dose would be actually the best way to go? And then secondly, why would you give it multiple times to times a day if you want to just focus on the most vulnerable time when the brain is seizing. So those are the two things. Thank you. Um, I know we're over time, but people aren't going anywhere because I think they're all so enthralled. I, have I force muted everybody? Should I unmute you, Marta and, and, and Hans and Aaron, so you guys can ask your questions? Here, Hans, I'll unmute you. I'll try to, it's not working. Marta, are you muted? Um, I'm here. Yeah, I have to use a different one because um, the connection is bad. Uh, my question is, did you notice any, any difference on the behavior of the mouse after the improvement with the phycoma? Did you notice that the hyperactivity improved or something? So, so, uh, that's, so that's what we're doing now. We are actually, uh, we are going to start looking at not only how their behavior changes, but how their uh, how their behavior in behavior testing for cognition whether it improves or not uh, with the low dose parampanol. So, so those are all on our radar, but we did not do it for this pilot study because at that point we were not even sure what we are going to see. But now we know what we expect to see, and now everything that you're bringing up have become very valid questions to be asked. Hans, Thank you. Hans, Aaron, do you want to chime in with your questions? Sure. Um, Mike, can you hear me? So I think the, my question would be uh, a lot of the EEGs that I have seen have been um, the, dur the duration is like one to two seconds with like a 3.5 to 4 hertz frequency. And oftentimes the comment from neurologists is they're not classifying those as seizures. Are you observing those same kinds of patterns um, in the mice? And then also, um, would you classify those as seizures as well? That's a very good question. And, uh, and that brings us to the point of just animal modeling. So that's why uh, I mentioned what the similarities were, but obviously a mouse is not, not a child. And yep. uh, the, we do, when I said short duration myoclonic seizures, they are short, but they are not like one or two seconds long. We do see one or two second long seizures that are not the typical spike. I showed you the one where the EMG was completely silent. So in that sense, it's not the exact phenotype, which by the way, uh, there is no such mouse model of epilepsy where you have the exact human phenotype, especially not for genetic epilepsy. The closest we get is with temporal lobe epilepsy, where there's very high seizure frequency and there's only one type of uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizure. But coming back to your more important question is when neurologists, when there's a short duration discharge and that's not classified as a seizure, that's just the nomenclature uh, and it's important for classification in the clinic and the reporting. But as a neuroscientist, any epileptiform discharge, we know, even a single spike people have shown, disrupts the learning memory circuit in the hippocampus. So whether it's a one second or two second discharge versus a four second discharge, for me as a scientist, that's still important to, to uh, identify and quantify. Uh, and human EGs really do not go into that level of granular 
it's, it's almost ironic that we use much higher and uh, resolution and granularity when we quantify the mouse EEG. But the similar thing does not happen even with these overnight EEGs when there are multiple uh, uh, multiple seizure events. Like for example, the, the, class, the one quantification and the trace I showed you for the one child. The report did not say how many events happened or where they happened. We had to go and identify them and, and clock the time and superimpose it onto the, the underlying power and the sleep EEG. Uh, so, so basically to shorten that answer, yes, in the clinic, a short duration epileptic form discharge is not classified as a seizure event. But for a neuroscientist, if a normal brain is not having that kind of episode, we know for a fact even short duration uh, discharges can disrupt uh, circuits. And that's why it's important to us. Amazing. Hans? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, thanks so much for the great talk. I just had a question because I believe Gavin and maybe Jimmy had a paper showing a diminishment in, in interictal spiking when uh, syngap expression was sort of turned on, I believe, with a phloxed mouse. Mm -hmm. Is interictal spiking something seen universally in our in our children, or is it something hit or miss? That's a very good question. Uh, so we have not started to quantify just spikes in the EEGs. We are still collect. I mean, once we have a good cohort, and that's why we are urging parents to send us or, or participate in our IRB study. Uh, for sure, the report does not tell you how many interictal spikes there were. Even in the one that, uh, so far, the ones we have seen, I have not noted a lot of interictal spikes. Yes, we have seen the seizure events, but, but although they are the three hertz seizures that I try, was trying to correlate between the mouse, they're not exactly the same. And the short duration, high frequency, three hertz spike wave discharges that, we, that are commonly reported even in the reports um, are very unique, but they're not unique to Syngap. Um, and I don't know, even from the literature, how many of when, when the epilepsy phenotype is predominantly three hertz spike wave discharges, how many, how, what, what role do interictal spikes play in that epilepsy? Um, and that, that literature is not that strong, I would assume, but, and it's never come my way. And even for the few EGs we have looked at from, from the clinic, uh, in, interictal spikes, of course they occur, but almost not at the frequency at which we see it uh, in the mice. And this is, I mean, this is, pre, this is premature at this point because we have not yet looked at multiple EGs. And so the, it'll be interesting to see whether certain children who have the same phenotype but have a lot of interictal spikes. That'll be very interesting. So both, yes, that is an important point to look at. Uh, the ones we've looked at, we don't have a very high predominance of interictal spikes. But that does not mean that there aren't syngap children that were high interest, right? But there's lots of literature to show because they are. People are using Medtronics, companies that are implanting uh, uh, units into the, uh, onto the scalp of patients uh, is you are using algorithms to quantitate interictal spikes to be able to predict when that adult is most likely going to have a seizure. So the idea being that then the patient will be injected with the drug or the, uh, or the anti-epileptic drug into the focus of wherever the seizure is starting. And that's, that's a new way of therapy for uh, in temporal lobe epilepsy or cortical uh, lesional epilepsy. So that's where intellectual spike research is very, very strong. It's, it's strong because it's being used as a predictive marker for oncoming epilepsy. Um, but in developmental uh, disorders, um, spikes do happen in, in, uh, in red syndrome in their EGs and they always come in non-REM. Um, what they mean for seizure prediction is an interesting question that I don't think people have yet started looking at in, in very young children. Does that answer your question? He's muted. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds like it remains to be seen based on a survey of child, syngap child EEGs, whether or not they have comparable interictal spiking. Correct, correct. Okay, and, great. And in Rett syndrome, we know there's massive interictal spiking. 
uh, I have not seen, uh, yes, once it gets characterized in the clinic, that'll be very important. In, it'll give us a lot of important insights. Great, thank you. And so just conscious of time, uh, next steps, we're gonna record, we're gonna share out the recording of this pretty quickly. Yeah. And then Dr. Karam, if you can share the link to that, that um, yes. study you're doing, we will, we will make sure to push that out as well. Yeah, I'll send you an email right after this is done. Both I'll attach both the forms and you can review them. If you have any questions, please feel free. I'll send my e email address too. And and uh, we are we are trying to collect these overnight EGs. If you have uh, if you have multiple in the sense that your child when they were three they had one and then they had one again when they were six, that would be priceless for us because then we would have a temporal progression EG for the same child. Um, mm. And then if you guys have a, you know, if you guys talk to you and figure out whether sibling EG is a, something doable, um, please let me know. And, and also let me know how I can help. Dr. Kautam, just to follow up on that question, if we have an EEG um, from after the child is two years old and one from just before they're two years old overnight EEG, would that still be beneficial to you? Yes, it's only unfortunately because of how the IRBs were initially written yep. uh, and, and special, uh, uh, pay, forms need to be filled when the child is less than two years old. Uh, I will have to write the amendment to get an EEG that's from, from a child that's less than two years old. Okay. So right now we are approved from two years old to 16 years old, uh, but I'm working on the amendment. So uh, at this point, if you have a, one that's over two years old, you can send that to us. And then once the amendment is done, are you already, you, the consent form will already be with us. I'll just send you the updated amendment and then you can uh, send me the earlier EEG. Sounds good. Which is, I mean, I don't know, but it's very interesting for us as we're finding that there is this one subgroup of children that is having seizures and severe seizures very early on. Yeah. And, uh, and the registry and the clinicians who are working on this, uh, the better they characterize this, the better it'll be for the field moving forward. Uh, because definitely something that's happening in a brain that's as young, less than two years old uh, is a whole different ballgame than something that's happening at five years old. Uh, and of course, then the class of drugs changes because most drugs are not approved uh, to be given for that younger child. So then that's why management becomes different. And then, so then, then the science needs to match what's happening at the bedside. And so then we have to start thinking that way. And so all the, the more we know, the better we will do. There goes my dog. Marthi, any, any other questions before I wrap it up? Um. Mm. My question is about the age with uh, my daughter is uh, she's 17. She's one of the oldest that then uh, can I still then you said it's 16 years old to your, your Yeah, that's the IRB. So if, if uh, extending it beyond 16 is not a problem because okay. there, there, there are no more extra rules and regulations with a two year old child. We just have to fill this extra less than two years old. We have to fill these extra forms. So now if I'm going to do the amendment, uh, is that the only EEG she has is after 16? No, no, no. She has, I actually have several of them to send you. Uh, the other question is, she's probably one of the few that uh, doesn't have any uh, seizures during EEGs or at least report it. And she doesn't have any activity reported. Okay. Um, then, but it still had a, a EEG is abnormal. Then, uh, yes, a hundred percent. So, I mean, those are the most, some of the most valuable EGs because we know that seizure events also have effect on these background oscillations. So if there is a recording of EG where there's not a single event, uh, that will also provide additional insights. Um, and also, like I said, these seizure events most likely also are dependent on the age. So there may be ages where the child is more vulnerable to higher uh, um, e uh, seizure events and there may be honeymoon periods as, ha as have been shown in other developmental disorders. And we don't know what that is for SYNGAP1 and what is the range or whether there are specific stages and whether all children fit in that stage or there are mostly outliers. All of this information hopefully now will start trickling in as more and more uh, people start getting involved. Can I, can I so uh, I'm going to wrap it up unless anyone's got a burning question. I want to thank everyone, especially the people from the, the Kadam lab for their time. Um, do you mind going back quickly to slide eight? I just think this is, I thought that was a super cool slide, but I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt you. 
Um, I, that diagram is amazing because I think that's what we live through, right? We have young kids, the P60s, who are only having myoclonic seizures and the parents aren't sure and they go to doctors and they go to neurologists and they take videos and people say they're not sure and it takes time. And then a few years later, proxied by the P120s, we have kids who are sure having seizures and we start seeing different phenotypes. So point one, I just think this is, this slide really is a Syngap parent and someone who talks to Syngap parents every day really speaks to me. And I, I think it's, I think it's awesome. That's point one. Um, point two is, I just want to highlight for the, for, for parents generally, this is what we, this is why SRF exists, right? To connect parents and scientists to emphasize the great work that scientists are doing. There's a lot of names on that last slide, but Dr. Kadam has been a, uh, someone who's taken our calls and talked to us many times. Brennan, who's the first author on that paper, is someone who was at our roundtable last year and is a young researcher and someone we're excited to see stay in Syngap for a long time. So uh, this, this has been a great webinar and I'm so grateful. Um, and the third point is just to build on that and say thank you. This, is, this was a great, this paper's amazing. Hopefully we'll have more kids on Parampanel. I think offline we'll ask you about why, why we wouldn't just do a study. But um, thank you so much for, for the work you do, for your lab, for this paper, and, and for doing this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And thank you for the opportunity. I mean, the feedback from parents uh, has been one of the biggest motivation uh, for my group, for Brendan, for sure. And, um, and yeah, and, and for us as, as researchers, uh, getting inputs of what's actually happening in the life of the patient and even in the, of the family, because uh, quality of life is an important component of us understanding. Uh, you know, cure is one thing, but there are many ways in which you can improve certain <laughs> categories of the disease. And so although we can keep cure on the horizon as the goal where we are headed to, we cannot miss all these side routes where we can make substantial uh, improvements in the management and understanding of how the disease is progressing. And that only comes from communication. So thank you guys for this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was very good. Thank you. I appreciate it all. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys.